good day to everyone from geneva <clears throat> i'm hari tulsidas and i along with charlotte griffiths welcome you all to this sixth session of unec resource management week 2021 this session is a workshop on critical raw materials the driver for the new low carbon economy how can we make supply sustainable this workshop is jointly organized by UNECE and the International Roundtable on Materials Criticality, IRTC. Some house housekeeping announcements. This session is being recorded. The session is having simulta simultaneous interpretation into English, French, and Russian. Please select your channel from the bottom menu. The speakers are also requested to speak slowly and clearly so that interpretation could be done effectively. Participants are requested to provide your comments uh, and ask questions in the chat box. Please make sure that you have selected all panelists and attendees when uh, you are making a comment. If any participant would like to speak, please raise your hand. <clears throat> Depending on the time available, the chair may decide uh, to provide the floor or not. You can provide your comments via email to reserves.energy at the rate un.org. We will be putting that email in the chat shortly. All the presentations and the recording will be uploaded to the meeting website. With this, I will hand over to Dave McDonald, who is the chair, who is chairing this session, who is also the chair of the expert group on resource management. Uh, over to you, uh, Dave, for taking this session forward. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Harry, and uh, welcome all of you um, uh, this afternoon here at uh, Geneva time um, uh, for a session on, as we said, critical raw materials. So <clears throat> as the economy, including energy, becomes greener, clearly critical raw materials are becoming more and more um, significant to us. The, uh, the number and variety of special metals and materials required for, for this green transition include lithium, nickel, cobalt, graphite, rare earth materials, a list of, of, of more than 30 different critical raw materials. If we consider this an age where oil and gas is essential for our daily lives, I think it's clear that the future will be dominated by these solid minerals, uh, just as they are today in, um, uh, for oil and gas for our energy production going forward. There is an apparent shortage of these materials today. Um, the supply of several CRMs is, is concentrated and processing of certain uh, critical raw materials such as rare earths require harsh chemical processes. Um, if, if demand for critical raw materials continues to increase to, um, to uh, many, many, many times folds, many folds uh, increases uh, as we expect, the environmental impact of this production is going to become a significant factor, something that we can't discount or ignore. In fact, from a variety of places across the globe, there have already been circumstances where we have seen significant vi environmental impacts as a result of critical uh, raw material mining. We are, however, of course, putting together new smart mining processes and recovery methods um, or using co-products uh, from various primary mining operations, mining tail, et cetera, that could make this scenario quite different going forward. We believe the United Nations framework classification and the in development United Nations resource management system emphasize a circularity that will be essential for the use of critical raw materials going forward. So with that delay, I'd like to start our discussions. I'm gonna begin by handing over to uh, Alessandra Hu, who will be our moderator um, for this, uh, for this afternoon. Uh, she's the CEO of the ESM Foundation and project manager, for the, project manager for the International Roundtable on Materials Criticality, the IRTC. Uh, we'll be using a, a whiteboard for communication during the talks today. And I believe the link to that is just being put up into the chat uh, now. So if you could all go into the chat room and have a look there. Um, um, Sophia has just posted that there. If you wouldn't mind opening that whiteboard during our discussions, we'll be able to use that um, as, as a tool for making comments on the, uh, various, um, uh, the various presentations. So with that, I'd like to uh, hand over to Alessandra for the remainder of the afternoon. So Alessandra. 
Thank you very much, uh, Harry and Dave, and, and thanks for giving us the opportunity here to co-organize uh, this session. Um, I quickly want to get back so um, about, about commenting. We, we hope that this will be an interactive session and you will see that in the last 20 minutes, half an hour, we will have actual time for discussion. Um, this will be a little bit difficult between the talks because we have to coordinate this in this online setting, but I kindly ask you to put everything you want to know of the speakers uh, about the topics or what you want to add, either in the text box or, or serve it for this last half, last half hour and then raise your hand. Or, and I would encourage this even more, um, is this uh, virtual whiteboard David just mentioned. And you now saw the link. I will quickly share my screen and show you how this whiteboard uh, looks like. So the idea is just to have um, a little more interactiveness. And by that, giving you the opportunity to in parallel to the talks to add your comments here. So you see here on the left, where we are now, for example, in welcome and introduction. And then you see here a specific question. In that case, you could just enter your name and affiliation if you want. Of course, you don't have to. And then with every talk, we are going a little bit more down and having some specific questions, which we would like you to comment on if you want to. Of course, this is not a must. This is just an option. And um, we look forward to, to, to a discussion maybe, and of course, to an interesting session. Um, thank you all for coming and especially thank you for the speakers today and I would like to give the floor to the first speaker, which is uh, Milan Grohol from the European Commission and he will talk about uh, CRM supply, current and future challenges. Yes, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I see that the presentation is already online. Uh, my name is Milan Grohol. I'm uh, from the uh, I'm from the uh, European Commission uh, Director General Grohl for uh, taking care of industry. In our department, we deal with uh, different raw materials from uh, different minerals, metals, wood, natural rubber, and recently also hydrogen. And uh, we perform uh, regular criticality assessments of the EU. Uh, in the same in our department as well. Uh, I would like to thank very much uh, Alessandra and Harry for organizing this session, and uh, uh, and I'm really looking forward to the to the discussions in the uh, in this uh, couple of hours we we have today. I was asked to to present the uh, supply challenges today in the future. That's exactly what we what we do in the Commission already since uh, over ten years. Uh, if I can ask for the next slide, please. Uh, it's not extremely new. We, in September, we published our uh, last analysis uh, of uh, critical raw materials for the whole EU economy. Uh, we identified 30 critical raw materials. There are four extra for some surprisingly bauxite, uh, lithium, titanium, and strontium for, uh, for some not. Uh, we, uh, we still have, uh, we dropped, unfortunately, uh, helium, which is somehow became uh, a bit at the edge of our calculations. But uh, critical or not, many raw materials are uh, necessary for the EU uh, economy and for the other economies as well. Uh, but we, are re we found we are really very dependent on, the, on uh, these ones. Uh, please, if we can go to the next slide. Okay. And that's, uh, this map shows actually who are the major importers uh, or suppliers of the EU economy for the critical raw materials. These are not all, but just major ones. And uh, as such, uh, uh, being uh, reliant on third countries is not the Big issue, the problem is if the supply is over concentrated in one or few countries only. And that uh, is causing us uh, concerns. As you see, there are, uh, there are several, uh, there are several uh, uh, critical raw materials which are concentrating in, concentrating in Asia, something in uh, Africa, 
but still, even if we have in Europe uh, production of uh, certain materials like hafnium or indium or strontium or gallium, it's uh, or germanium, it's still very concentrated and uh, the risk is still high for us. Uh, next slide, please. We also this time in 2020, we mapped uh, uh, the critical raw materials uh, entering the EU industrial ecosystems, uh, especially for aerospace defense, electronics, mobility, so automotive and other forms of transport, energy intensive industries, renewable energy, construction. These are very important elements and uh, minerals, which we uh, which we wanted to, to show to, to our colleagues. Uh, and uh, it's not only, uh, this, this exercise is not done only for, uh, uh, for the external uh, audience, but it's also for our uh, policy making in different areas. So this table, even though a little bit uh, packed with information is very important for us. Next slide, please. In parallel, we did uh, also an analysis of uh, uh, flows of materials from uh, the, or use of material, raw materials in the different technologies, in te te technologies and three strategic sectors. We screened uh, batteries, uh, technologies, uh, especially the lithium ion, fuel cells, wind turbines, uh, electric motors, photovoltaics, robotics, drones, 3D printing and some ICT technologies. And we see that the, the chains are, or the supply chains are extremely complex. There are some sectors who, or some applications uh, like wind and traction motors, which compete for, uh, uh, for rarets, for example, even though ICT, that's what we did not screen much, is the, the use of uh, rarets in, uh, in uh, hard drives or in uh, electronics. That, that was that's a little bit uh, missing here. We will fix it in the next uh, report. But uh, we see that uh, there is at the same time competition, but uh, high complexity of uh, supply chains for, uh, uh, for different technologies and sectors. Next one, please. For the first time, what, uh, we did also the uh, prediction of uh, potential needs which we, uh, which we will have by 2030 and by 2050. Uh, 2050 seems too far, but actually for investment in uh, raw materials projects, it's not such a long time. So uh, we found out that uh, at maximum, uh, we could expect a huge increase in uh, lithium uh, demand, cobalt demand, uh, lithium over 50 times more than we use uh, uh, today for all applications could be used just for, for uh, uh, batteries, fuel cells, wind turbines and photovoltaics. So practically immobility and renewable energies. Similar uh, cobalt is over 10 times while you, we know that cobalt is mostly used for steel, but still the increase is, is huge or expected. The same for the rarets, which Europe is uh, hardly using directly because most of the uh, products are imported uh, or the raw materials are imported in form of uh, semi-products or products. So the increase will be quite big as well. Next one, please. So when we dive in a little bit, uh, we see that uh, what we screened is the, uh, the use of uh, raw materials in different uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, the different stages. And we uh, also screened the, uh, the criticality of uh, not only of raw materials, but also process materials, components and assembly systems or technologies, if you want. So here is an example for uh, lithium ion batteries. There we saw that the, the, the bottlenecks are for the EU practically at all stages. We are uh, really, uh, dependent on, uh, on everything from raw materials until, until the final technology, and uh, especially the uh, 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 lithium battery cells. There are plenty of different materials, but uh, we also highlighted which ones are on the list uh, on critical raw materials. Uh, they are in red in the top left uh, core, uh, part. So cobalt, lithium, graphite, niobium, 
silicon, titanium, uh, phosphorus, and uh, fluor are uh, critical for us. And that's, uh, this also impacts the, the overall basket of, uh, of uh, criticality of this raw material step. Next slide, please. At the same time, we also uh, screened for uh, uh, the, the, or we tried to estimate with three different scenarios. Sorry. I think we have some background noise. Somebody, uh, can we mute uh, colleagues? Colleague. Uh, not speaking. Yeah, I'll mute it. Please go ahead. Oh, okay, really. thank you. Uh, then we have uh, uh, these, uh, we try to predict the uh, the use of different uh, materials for uh, uh, for 20, 30, 20, 50 in three different scenarios: low demand, uh, medium demand, and high demand scenario. High demand scenario is the one where the EU would like to go. It uh, corresponds to the 1.5 uh, degrees uh, uh, target for 2050, which Europe would like to go for. And uh, this is the, the highest uh, uh, position of the bars uh, on, the, on the screen. So we see that uh, especially immobility is the, the driver for, uh, for lithium, for graphite, for cobalt in the future. So uh, battery raw materials, as we call them internally. Next slide, please. Here is a similar uh, example for uh, electric motors and generators. There, the situation uh, is uh, even worse, I would say, from the EU point of view, uh, where uh, potentially also for the, the rest of the world, uh, here is a very clear dominance and uh, uh, leadership of China in, uh, in uh, different steps of the, of the uh, uh, value chain. We are doing, uh, especially for the electric motors, for the uh, wind, gener wind energy uh, generators, Europe is doing quite well in the components and in the uh, in some components and uh, in uh, in the assemblies, where we have uh, st still some uh, global leaders in uh, in um, uh, wind energy. But this situation can uh, can of course change over, over time, and that we are uh, quite aware of because the uh, uh, this graph would would be quite uh, changing over time. Thank you, next slide. And uh, my uh, practically last slide, uh, before last slide is uh, uh, on what we do want to do about it. Uh, we have 10 actions, how to deal with the situation uh, in four blocks uh, to improve resilience through setting up European Raw Materials Alliance, which is uh, already done and uh, the alliance is working, uh, developing sustainable financing criteria, taxonomy for, for mining, that's uh, work ongoing in the EU. Then the second block is to improve circularity. So investment in research for waste processing and vast materials and substitution and mapping the, the supply of secondary raw uh, critical raw materials from the EU stocks and wastes, because that's what we have not done. And, uh, uh, there are a lot of estimates, but they are not very useful and precise. Uh, third block is domestic supply. These are actions five to eight. Again, uh, uh, um, uh, we have research, but we, have uh, we, we are trying to map the, uh, the mining projects, which can be operational by the relatively short uh, while, 2025. And there we, we see a big use of uh, UNFC classification because that's the only one which can compare different projects. Uh, and also not only from economic, but also uh, environmental and social point of view. And of course, we would like to in, uh, improve expertise and skills. We would like to use the Earth Observation Program, Copernicus, which we have, and uh, also others, and invest in research and innovation as we did also for the waste processing, here also an exploration and uh, mining and processing of criticals. That's what we will do through Horizon Europe program, which will start uh, the first call in May. And uh, we, in the fourth block, we try to uh, work with our partners through strategic international partnerships to secure critical raw materials. 
uh, there we really move uh, quickly with uh, some countries like Canada, Australia, Ukraine, Serbia. Uh, we uh, go to Africa as well and Latin America. Uh, we would also like to promote responsible mining practices. We are developing the principles for the EU and uh, uh, we would like to have the, uh, the, uh, the sourcing which is clean, but also ethical. So that's that's very important message. And my last slide is uh, maybe takeaways. Uh, as we heard uh, from David, uh, uh, critical raw materials are slowly replacing uh, the fossil fuels and, uh, uh, and that's something which we'll need to reflect on. And uh, I would uh, uh, be happy if, uh, the uh, United Nations classification framework and uh, uh, the newly developed uh, or developing uh, United Nations resource management system would pay attention to, to critical raw materials and their life cycle management, because that's something which, uh, which will be the trend for the next uh, decades. And second uh, point is uh, we will need both primary and secondary sources. And we have uh, specifically uh, working groups on minerals and anthropogenic uh, resources, which could strengthen this path. And uh, we, also, uh, we also have uh, projects like uh, EU funded project like this International Roundtable on Criticality and Screen uh, Expert Network, which uh, have a vast consortium of experts from the EU. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Um... Milan for this introduction. I think it's very interesting. We also see questions coming in and we'll save this for the end. Thanks a lot. Also, please don't forget, uh, you can add any time to this um, virtual whiteboard where the link is in the chat. Um, so we come now to our next speaker, which is uh, Magnus Eriksson from Sweden, and he will talk about the uh, critical raw materials mining's contribution to national economies. Magnus, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I will take a com completely different perspective in my presentation. I will look at this from the emerging economies point of view. And very interesting, I'll do so based on three studies which have been funded within the United Nations system. Einstein in Geneva and two studies for United Nations University wider institute in Helsinki. And, um, uh, my message is that there is huge potential for emerging economies with mineral resources coming into this uh, new uh, period. I will start with a general discussion on mining's contribution. I call it contribution. Some people prefer the, the dependency word, but I think uh, it could be very well used. Here is, uh, um, we studied all countries in the world and looked at uh, four factors, the share of money in, in GDP, export contribution, the exploration in each country, and also the uh, mineral rents contribution to governments. And, and as you can see here, these are the 10 countries among the low, less developed countries and, and middle income countries, which where mining contributes most, most. and, and in a, mainly in Africa, there are uh, these mining sectors play a very important role. Uh, if you, this was the situation in 2018, as you see in this slide here. We also looked at the situation over time, and you can see here we uh, have used the percentage of GDP, the contribution to GDP and contribution to exports. And every dot here is a year. And you can see that during the period of the uh, super cycle, the importance of mining rose, both in this case in Brazil and Sweden. But the important thing is that also when prices went down, it was still more contributive, mining contributed more than it did in 1996. And at present, we are into a very interesting period. Prices are high. Will, we st will there be a start of a new uh, super cycle where emerging economies can benefit 
from this. Before I go into the critical raw materials, I also like to give you a, a, a little snapshot of mining as it is today. Uh, here, each circle, the value of mine production in all countries is represented here. And, and for example, yellow is gold. So we can see here that in those countries where mining contributed most on my previous map, they are not countries where mining means a lot globally. They are countries where mining means a lot for their national economies and their national development. To put the um, battery metals and ICT metals, which I will discuss later into perspective, this is a snapshot of the value of total global mine production. As you can see, coal accounts for half of that, which of course is going to be an issue or a problem, if you like, for all uh, coal producing emerging economies, if that is going to be cut down in any way. And on the left-hand side, you see metals and minerals, all of them. And it's interesting that iron ore, copper and gold accounts for roughly you know, two thirds of the total value. So that is the setting against which I'm going to talk now, metals for a low carbon future. I hope I'm not talking too fast for the interpreters. That's my uh, habit of getting up to speed when I talk about interesting things. Well, anyhow, we uh, in a study for uh, wider the World Institute for Development Economics Research in Helsinki, we looked at um, 13 different elements that are of importance for the uh, uh, battery production, basically. And we looked at four um, or five, sorry. We looked at what resources are known in all countries of the world. What is the production today? What is the exploration in all these countries? Uh, and we looked at the mining contribution index. And finally, is there an established mining industry? We merge those five factors into an index, if you like. And here are the countries among the emerging economies which have the best possibilities, according to those five measures, to benefit from these increased, these increased demands. And again, it's interesting to see that there are um, several countries in Africa which could potentially uh, benefit from, from these increased demands that we see. And finally, this is a study which we did for Angstad. Uh, it's a, published as an Angstad technical note on ICT for developments number 16 in 2020. And here, this is a microscope view or a blow up of that circle of the value of all elements I showed you previously. And here you see these are seven ICT elements, rare earths, tellurium, selenium, gallium, indium, germanium, and tantalum. And together they account for much less than if we don't include the rare earths, you can see it's about 0.01, sorry, 0.1% of the total value of a global mine production. This is figures for, for 2018. So um, we, can, we, we mapped these production of these elements onto the world. And the situation here is simply that there is a lot of production of these ICT elements uh, at, in China, in the US, Canada, you see, and, and the, there is not the same dominance in, uh, in emerging economies as there were in the previous slides. And also uh, combined with the fact that the, the total value of these metals are very limited, is very limited. Uh, our conclusion is that the potential for the sort of hardware elements to produce those for emerging economies much less than it is for the battery and, and, and the, the metals and elements around the, the, the hard core in the computer. So uh, our conclusion is that 
Well, for certain countries, this could become uh, an important growth potential, but for most emerging countries, it is not. So my conclusions and our conclusions, they are listed here, but basically I'd, I'd like to say that the, the problems associated with mining are well known. And uh, the, the key now for the emerging economies is to be able to grasp the possibilities and avoiding all the pitfalls, all the difficulties when it comes to environment, socioeconomic developments, et cetera. But I think uh, here, as Milan was talking about, the European Commission and the European Union and European countries, uh, I'm, I'm myself from Sweden, have a, a, a role to play to transfer technologies and others, other opportunities to emerging economies and grow the uh, mining sector in countries in Africa, for example, rather than trying to uh, utilize marginal deposits which might be found in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Magnus, for this very interesting perspective and overview. Um, and I see the discussion is continuing, which uh, I encourage. Um, we come now to a contribution by our um, consortium member, Gavin Mudd, on um, CRM supply options, the recent research results. And since he is uh, from, from Melbourne and thus Australia, he won't participate live, but we have a video, uh, video recording of him with his talk and um, I apologize that this video will not be interpreted because the, 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 sound, the, the sound is well enough for us to understand, but it's not sufficient for the interpreters. So um, this one will only be available on English. Our apologies. Uh, just a moment, some difficulty in getting it started. Let me do it once more. One moment, please. The, the research we've been doing from Australia with my, my, myself, but also colleagues from uh, Monash and the, the Critical Minerals uh, Consortium. Yes, that works. Uh, and also Simon Jow at, at uh, the University of Nevada in uh, Las Vegas. And basically looking at what that means in terms of sustainable supply options to meet all of the technological demands that we have uh, this uh, coming uh, few decades, I guess, and, uh, and perhaps beyond. But uh, also acknowledging the, uh, the the support we've had from Geoscience Australia for um, a lot of this research. Now, one of the problems I think that's out there is a lot of people uh, that think that this lack of data on uh, on a lot of our critical elements uh, really means that we have a lack of data uh, on the actual supply potential. And part of that is the fact that there's really you're the only group that publishes global estimates of reserves. And of course, remembering that we really should be very mindful that reserves has a technical meaning in mining. It's the short term economic and profitable resources that we can mine or profitable mineralization that we can mine. I really should be careful about my own words, I guess. And so the only group that really tries to do global estimates of reserves and of course trying to get equivalents around these things internationally is very difficult, but the USGS do the best they can. All right. And so if you look at the, uh, you know, the various elements that I've got out there, uh, there's often a lack of data. That lack of data can be driven by the fact that we're dealing with substitute elements. So elements such as uh, cadmium, germanium, and indium uh, really only substitute into uh, the primary economic minerals. So if we take indium, for example, it's a substitute element in minerals like sphalerite. And so wherever we're mining zinc, you know, zinc sulfide, sphalerite, 
um, we'll always get some indium. The question is how much. But because of that, we focus on the, uh, the zinc. The indium, if you're lucky, might be 1% of the value of the zinc. So we tend to ignore that zinc content. And the same thing with, we see with bismuth and cadmium and many others and things like cadmium are seen as a toxic element. So they're seen as a penalty in the way that we process. So they're not seen as something we want. But with uh, cadmium telluride solar panels, we need more cadmium. And so we need to understand this thing. But if we compare that to our uh, traditional metals such as gold nine ore, we do have excellent data. So we have the methods, we have the ability to do this. It's just that we haven't been doing it, I guess, for a lot of these elements. All right. And again, I really, as I mentioned before, a lot of these elements are very small markets. They're readily supplied by a handful of companies or, or sometimes countries around the world. All right. And they're typically very low value. And that's what we're really seeing. If we're looking at the, the global iron ore industry, it's probably you know, 250 billion US dollars, of which Australia would be, uh, say, half. Now, if you're looking at, uh, say, silver or indium and a whole bunch of other metals, right, um, we're looking at stuff that's really, really uh, small value. And so it's not something that um, you know, creates a high driver. Right? And so typically, if you're operating, say, a copper mine, you're worried about copper and maybe gold, maybe silver, but not much else. All right, and so what that means is that if there are any substitute elements that carry through in the concentrates that make it through to the smelters and the refineries, that leaves it up to the smelting and refining companies. All right, and so often that means this lack of data, this lack of uh, you know, understanding of how much is in resources, how much is in concentrates, how much is actually flowing through our uh, smelters and refineries, that's often confused. There's lack of data means lack of supply. And that's absolutely not true. It's uh, right. And so um, I guess what we've been doing is, uh, you know, steadily working through a lot of these sorts of problems now. So we've had research published on cobalt, uh, a classic sort of byproduct element that's associated with nickel as well as cobalt, um, as well as trying to understand, well, if you're looking at some of the most uh, critical areas like rare earth elements, but also methods such as uh, indium and others, right? Uh, how can we start to build a better database, a better understanding and really quantify, well, how much supply potential really is there? And so from a, Australia's point of view, I guess we've got uh, a lot of the, the, the primary elements that could be host to the substitute critical elements, as well as the deposits of things like rare earths and lithium and, and many others as well. So we've been, uh, I suppose, looking at that now for, uh, for some time. Now, if we look at uh, critical metals, we can see that this sort of little white area we can see how small that is in comparison to all the others over time. And this is looking at the proportional economic value in equivalent 1998 dollars uh, over uh, the last century or so. And so we can see, if we look at the data, we can look at the amount of tellurium that we've actually been extracting from our copper refineries. And so we can see that it goes up and then comes back down. And same with rhenium and, uh, and then indium as well. So as I mentioned, a lot of these critical metals, are, they're, they're dominated by particular countries. And so we're concerned about that supply. And so typically when we're looking at critical minerals, um, when we don't really find primary deposits of them. And so we have to rely on these primary elements. And so really that's one of the things that I guess, given that we, can, we have good data on the primary elements, we can then estimate what that means in terms of critical minerals as well. So a lot of the work we've been doing here is looking at uh, various elements, whether it's the primary, uh, sometimes elements that are reported directly like scandium, lithium and rare earth. But where we don't have direct data, we have to come up with some way of estimating that. And so the, the method we've been using is, is what I often call the Werner method, where we use geochemical relationships, geochemical databases between the host mineral or elements such as say zinc uh, and say indium. Uh, to then look at the way we can estimate the grades for uh, the, the, the critical metal, All right? And so again, it, it's fairly straightforward, but it does take a lot of work. If we look at Australia, we've, we've seen over time the, the rise and fall of different sectors of our mining industry. So we, we started out with a, a relatively small black coal industry, but it was all that we mined. Then we discovered copper, then the gold industry boom, the, the tin industry here, which is uh, this miscellaneous metals here that's mostly tin. We can see the rise of Broken Hill and the, the, the rise of lead zinc silver. Uh, and again, if we look at the magnitude of these numbers, really black coal and uh, iron ore have really uh, dominated our industry now. All right? And so 
and again, it just shows you this changing time. So we, we still have plenty of these primary metals left. It's, uh, I guess, really, really important to understand that. A recent study we've, uh, we've literally just submitted is looking at global nickel, and that's looking at uh, all the different de deposits of nickel around the world, our magmatic sulfides of, of numerous types, our flood basalts related, our uh, intrusion related, comatiites, uh, impact related, such as Sudbury, uh, as well as the primary uh, you know, different types of nickel laterite ore, our clay, sil our clay silicates, hydrous magnesium silicates and oxides, and a handful of um, miscellaneous other deposits as well. And so what we can see if we uh, start to decode this graph is the triangles of all the nickel laterite. So they're here, they're typically uh, higher grade um, and some quite large deposits too. Um, our magmatic sulfides are often lower grade. Uh, you can get some quite large deposits, including up here. But uh, what that shows you is there's a two different classes. Now, often our magmatic sulfides have a, a polymetallic nature to them. They're nickel, copper, um, uh, cobalt, uh, and platinum group element as well. And so when you start converting that and say, well, let's take the grade and convert that to the equivalent US dollar value per ton of ore, we see that the overall grades of co-products and byproducts such as co copper, cobalt, and the PGEs uh, basically link in with the nickel laterites where you may or may not have cobalt present and we get a much more sort of uh, uniform sort of spread here. And the reason that's important is because Skinner back in the 1970s argued that really we have two, two um, distributions, I guess, of metals typically. We have our higher grade uh, mineral deposits, which may be sulfides or oxides or something like that. And then you've got bulk silicate rock, whether that be granite or limestone perhaps or something else. But, but really we're mining this rich rock. And why that's important is because when you go through this mineralogical barrier, this switch from one um, you know, uh, uh, distribution to the other, this mineralogical barrier where you change that mineral type, of course, that means you have this massive increase in energy uh, intensity for the amount of uh, energy required to extract that particular metal. All right? And so that creates this barrier to the economic uh, extraction of that metal. And so that's really, really important. And so a lot of our data, I guess, really reinforces this. But if we look at some individual copper mines and so on, we could just have a, a select view here, and there's a lot more out there from our various papers. We could look at Mount Isa in uh, Western Queensland here in Australia, and it's been continually increasing its amount, amount of resources. All right, we can see here the amount of production in uh, red over time versus the uh, official reserves versus additional resources and the potential for an open cut expansion there. And to mean is another one where we see continual expansion over time, and same with Olympic Dam. And this is a very common pattern. It doesn't always happen with mines, of course. Eventually, at some point, a mine does become depleted. All right? It depends on the deposit, the geology, the economic, the technology involved, all of these sorts of things. Hidden behind all of that is this long-term trend of declining ore grade. And uh, I, it's, it's, I still find it difficult to believe that there are people out there who believe it's not a real problem. We could look at copper, it's all downhill. We could look at nickel, it's all downhill. We could look at uh, lead, it's all downhill. Zinc, all downhill. I have the same graphs for, for gold and uh, other commodities as well. All right. Now within that, we need to understand the, uh, the host economic minerals, how refractory the ore is, um, what processing technology uh, is possible, uh, but also things like impurities, whether they're toxic or valuable, and so on, right? And that, that's that's quite important to understand our critical minerals, but but what it means is that we're having to process more and more tons of ore to get our basic metals that we're, we're looking for. Right? So it means that our environmental impact is going up. It does not mean we're running out. It means our environmental impact is going up. And so if we look at copper in uh, closer detail, we can see Australia rich oxide ores here in the, uh, the mid 1800s. By about the turn of the century, we we're down to sulfide ores and tiny bit of moving up and down between underground and open cut. Um, but again, our long-term trend is all downhill, right? And pretty much every country around the world follows that same sort of pattern. Let's look briefly at some case studies. So if we look at scandium, it's probably one of the very few elements we don't really mine on a, a great global scale yet, um, but the, that's just changed. In the Philippines now, we've just started mining and extracting scandium on a commercial scale. And so that's associated with nickel laterite uh, production. All right, so the, the main demand for scandium could be uh, aluminium scandium alloys, these super uh, performing lightweight alloys. 
but also solid oxide fuel cells emerging. Uh, and maybe they'll emerge a lot more. I'm not sure. We'll, we'll see what happens with the hydrogen economy. All right. And so certainly in Australia, we have uh, a whole range of nickel laterites that are known to have uh, scandium. Uh, and so again, this is based on reported data. So we can say, look, we've got quite a lot of scandium. So even if we're uh, producing 50 tons a year at the moment, say most of which would come from the Philippines, we can see that, that uh, Australia's resources and reserves alone represents a huge body of scandium that could help supply and meet these sort of global demands. Rare earths is something that people often talk about quite a lot. We can see the rise of China in this sort of graph here. But again, we need to understand whether we're talking about the light or the heavy rare earth fractions. All right. Um, but again, because of this rapid technological change we've seen over recent years, um, we need rare earths more and more and more. And whether that's from military technology, but also renewable energy, electric vehicles, wind turbines, everything. So if we look at Australia, we can see our rare earths um, are mostly sitting in deposits. The vast majority of this blue area would actually just be one deposit at Olympic Dam. All right? And so that's something of the order of 50 million tonnes alone. All right? And so... At the moment, we have two primary mines at Mount Weld in Western Australia, but also Browns Range on the, the West Australia Northern Territory border, uh, as well as some other product uh, projects, which are probably not too far away potentially, as well as heavy mineral sands as a potential byproduct uh, in terms of monazite extracted along with rutile, ilmenite, and zircon. So we can plot that out and we can look at you know, where around the world are our rare earths. We can see you know, China, Bay and Oboe, for example, Olympic Dam here. Uh, and a whole range of other deposits. But again, we need to understand the, the detail. If we look at lithium, for example, we can see that Australia over the last sort of 10 to 15 years, especially has had a huge growth in the amount of lithium that we can see as economic and, and potentially sub-economic to mine in the near future. And so Australia now, and I think we've moved forward even from this position, we're now at about 70 kilotons of lithium at about 100 kilotons of lithium worldwide. All right, and so that our lithium now, our exports of lithium, is actually now more valuable than our uranium exports, which is uh, a huge turning point, I think, in uh, Australia and, and the way we're looking at our mining industry. And I mentioned this sort of substitute nature. So when you're looking at a, an element like rhenium, it's the one that provides these sort of uh, you know, high temperature, super strong alloys that are used in things like jet turbines, as I showed earlier. And so it's a substitute element in molybdenite, so molybdenum sulfide. And so we can look at the geochemical data for something like rhenium versus molybdenum. And we know that uh, this is for the Merlin deposit on the left. We can see that once you get up into more economic grades of rhenium, you can get a fairly good linear correlation typically between the, uh, the rhenium concentration and the molybdenum concentration. And you can see for Borovic in uh, Serbia, it's, uh, again, another reasonable correlation between our rhenium and our molybdenum. So even though globally we don't have a lot of data on rhenium, um, we do have a lot of data on molybdenum. And so we can use these types of relationships uh, in order to then say, well, actually, yeah, if we know the molybdenum grade, we can then predict and calculate or extrapolate what that means for, for, uh, for rhenium. And so we term this extrapolated quantities. So we certainly don't try and pretend that they're, they're, they're resources, they're not code-based, right? but uh, they're very important. And so it allows us to start to get a sense of like, well, how much rhenium is out there that we could start to uh, actually look at to meet future demands. And you could start looking at all of the other metals and go start, you know, work your way through the periodic table. All right, and this is some work we've got uh, in uh, our process at the moment that will be hopefully published very soon. All right, and again, hafnium, it's a substitute element in zircon, so zirconium silicate. All right, and so again, Australia has a huge amount there. The other thing that's uh, something else, I guess, we've started more recently is looking at the amount in tailings. And so how much uh, can we reprocess our old tailings to potentially get old, uh, uh, new metals or minerals or elements out of old tailings? All right, and so this is something that I guess what we're doing is looking at a, a, a dot on the map here for every single mine, how much tailings is there, what are the likely grades, and what can we learn about the potential for critical minerals from each of these tailings deposits. Now, within that, as I mentioned, we still have to think about not only just where we get our primary supply from, but we still need to think about how much we're recycling at the end of life of a product, but then when we're making new products, 
how much recycled content is there in that? And this is some work that was led by uh, Tom Gradle and his group from Yale uh, on behalf of the International Resources Panel through uh, the UN Environment Program uh, some years ago. And I think what it shows us is that we've still got a long way to go before we get to this uh, circular economy. All right, so if we look at the uh, the famous uh, metal wheel that Barbara Reck developed at, at Yale with uh, Tom Gradle, we can see we've got our um, our mining and so on, and our, our, our smelting, refining, fabrication, manufacturing and use, and all of the links in between. And so that's really what we mean when we're talking about a circular economy. Um, another way to look at it is the way the Alan MacArthur Foundation looks at it. So we've got our, our uh, technological materials or our elements on the right here, and we've got uh, maintenance, refurbishment, um, recycle. Uh, um, so there's a lot of different, you know, from a policy point of view, there's a lot of different things we can do to help increase the value that we get out of our uh, metals and so on. And then on the left hand side, it's our biomass or, or mainly carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus as well on the, on the left hand side. So out of all of that, we know that our critical minerals are important. We need to be able to quantify them better. Right? And I think one of the problems, I guess, that I've, I've, we've seen out there is lack of data. People confuse as lack of supply or lack of certainty. And that's certainly not the case. There's a lot of factors in it and depending on the metals, um, we know that we have great confidence in the amount of metals and the amount of materials that could be used to help um, meet um, our, our goals and ambitions around climate change, renewable energy, uh, as well as uh, transport uh, and everything else we need to do, uh, without forgetting that eventually we need to make sure we're moving towards a much more, more circular economy. All right? And so that means that we need to understand how to make our supply chains for these metals and these minerals much, much more sustainable. Just some acknowledgements uh, and uh, thank you, leave it there. So my thanks goes to goes to Gavin Mutt for pre-recording this for us. And I saw there were a few questions to the panelists which, which were about the presentation. So we will be happy to, to forward this, of course. Um, with this, we go to the next presentation by Luisa Moreno about capacity building in supplying countries, what is needed. And uh, on the board or in the chat, we are asking you the question, how can your country benefit optimally, in your opinion, from domestic resource extraction? Luisa, the floor is yours. We don't hear you yet. Um, I still don't hear you. Now, okay, now sorry, I was great. muted. No worries. <laughs> now you're loud and clear. Okay, fantastic. Um, okay, so, okay, sorry. So here we go. I'm ready now. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Alessa, for inviting me and thank you, UNEC, uh, for uh, organizing this and, and for having me. Um, I will try to quickly, I believe we have about 10 minutes to, to go over uh, my, my presentation. Um, some of what I will be touching here was already um, touched somehow by the two first uh, presenters, I believe it was uh, Milan and Magnus. Uh, so I, the, the perspective that I will be presenting uh, is, is based on my background, uh, is more from an investment analyst perspective. So uh, working in banks and uh, investment banks and what uh, I did was support really uh, the team with finding, identifying, uh, valuing, um, strategic materials, uh, mines uh, and projects uh, around the world and, and help with the financing. And, and so uh, a lot of what I will be presenting is, is somehow inspired by that. Yes, we have a lot of resources around the world, but uh, there are difficulties in, in advancing them because not all of them uh, are really economic at the current prices. So I will, uh, the, the topic of my presentation is really critical raw materials, capacity building in supplying countries like Canada and what, ne what is needed. So I, I'm basically located in, in Canada, Toronto uh, right now. So um, of the various uh, materials that have been identified as critical and, and Milan has uh, showed uh, those, um, Worked at a Tahuti Global, uh, that's my company, independent firm. Uh, the work that we did, uh, we identified about 40 materials that have been uh, listed as critical by US, uh, Japan, EU, and, and Canada. Of those, 
um, about 20, more than 20, um, you know, we see that China basically is the largest producer of those. Now, if you look at Canada, um, Canada is one of the largest countries in the world, and uh, it really just tops two, two materials, potash and, and, and cesium. But we do have uh, resources for most uh, of, of, of the critical materials, uh, just like China. But China, although has a smaller country um, relatively to Canada, they basically um, have uh, taken different steps. And um, in part because China can only rely on China. Politically, we, I think we all understand why. When you look at um, the Western world, there are coalitions, there are alliances, Canada, Australia, uh, Europe, and so forth. And, um, and they can, to some extent, um, have good relationships with their uh, colonies as well in Africa and in South America. Um, China never really had that uh, in the beginning. And so China had to rely on China. And one of the things that they've done, they develop uh, technologies uh, themselves. One example, and I will not uh, digress here too much, but one example that I would like to bring is, for instance, bauxite. Milan identified that now as, as, as a critical mineral. Bauxite is a mineral for aluminum. And, um, and so most of the bauxite comes from places like Brazil uh, and, um, you know, uh, uh, Equatorial Guinea, mostly uh, in, in the tropics. And China does have bauxite, but their bauxite is much lower grade, is in the 20%. And these other countries have it in the higher 40s. So for all intents and purposes, people think that's actually not economic. But China went ahead and they developed what is called a modified Bayer process. Uh, to, to produce their own uh, uh, bauxite. The Russians have done something similar with nifelin, which is another mineral for, for aluminum, and they developed their own uh, processing technology. So these countries um, like Russia and, and like uh, uh, China, they had to develop their own technologies. They have to use their own resources, even if uh, the grades are low. So the Chinese government has a very hands-on approach for the development of their uh, own minerals. So they tend to control uh, the resource companies. They partially own those companies. They offer aid in form of grants, low interest loans uh, to not just to the industry in general, not just the, the mining, but also the processing. Uh, so this is my point number four. So they support companies along the supply chain. They implement production quarters so that they can control the economy, uh, sorry, the, the production internally, so that, can't, so that the various companies don't overproduce. Uh, and then they obviously, as we know, they implement export quarters as well to control their resources. Um, and finally, um, they, they have, especially in the last few years, uh, funded lots of uh, research uh, hubs and, and centers, and they're actually building them in Africa as well. I spent a little bit of time in Africa, um, and I was able to, to see that firsthand. So um, some people would say, okay, we cannot do what, what, can, what, what, sorry, what China is doing. But the reality is, um, you know, the EU um, is follow, has followed a similar process, if I might say that, when it comes to their automotive industry, uh, particularly the battery supply chain. So you see some headlines, the EU approves more state aid to boost car batteries industry. And, um, and within the raw materials, um, the EIT um, alliance, they, they have uh, as one of uh, their aims to assess EU funding opportunities and finance uh, sources of, you know, sorry, and financing sources for investment opportunities inside and outside Europe. And Milan has, has sort of uh, spoken about that, that, you know, uh, in their point, in his point nine, uh, in one of the slides that the EU is going to be looking at uh, potentially um, uh, looking in Africa and, and Canada, they have alliances and so forth. But what I want to emphasize here is the term aid and, and really emphasize that that has to be very much similar to what China does in many ways. Um, because not all these projects are as economic as we would like them to be. So before I dive into the economics of these projects, I just want to see, to show you a little bit, and I, Milan also has uh, sort of alluded to that, um, these are our projections at the hoodie uh, in terms of where um, the demand will be for lithium and, and nickel. 
the, the, the graphs are the same for graphite uh, for, uh, and for other battery materials, but for interest of time, we just showed here um, what the situation is currently. So we see for, 20, for 2020, um, the demand is, is almost 30,000 tons. Last year, the production was 77,000. But by 2030, um, effectively nine years from now, we are expecting a demand uh, for lithium just for the electric vehicles to increase significantly from you know, the 77,000, that is call it 100,000 uh, in 2020, to, to 329, uh, basically three times more. Um, and then going to 2050, that number is just completely ridiculous, especially you know, over a, a million, especially when you compare uh, with uh, the current production uh, today. And it seems too far away, but really uh, is not. Uh, nickel is, is extremely critical as well, not right now. We have 2.7 million production um, with demand for uh, EVs only at about 150,000. So what you see uh, in 2020, there are 150,000 tons, 150,991 tons. This is the demand or what was used um, for, for batteries uh, in 2020. And, and so going forward, we see that um, they, they, there's certainly gonna be an issue. About 70% of all the nickel in the world is used for the steel industry. And if we don't find more, um, there's, it's going to be definitely a crisis. So how are these projects uh, basically uh, funded? So the, the EU has focused on giving aid to battery companies and, 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 and processing companies and so forth. But mining companies also need support. And we don't see that a lot. In Canada, for instance, we support our oil industry uh, and the automotive industry. They get lots of grants and, and, and participation from the government. But there is always a resistance, for whatever reason, uh, to support um, mining companies. And, and they definitely do need. So that is a model which I'm not, uh, I don't have the time to discuss how really mining uh, is sort of funded, um, usually from a junior um, state to, to a more mature state. But what I will emphasize here is that if you look at exploration, global exploration funding, um, most of the funding goes for, and, and this excludes uh, iron, you know, the ferrous metals and he excludes coal. Uh, Magnus had shown uh, a similar graph. This one only shows uh, gold and base metals and the strategic materials. As you can see, there is not a lot of funding uh, for exploration today going to strategic materials. And, and so, however, you know, we, we see that um, there is great demand um, and you, the graph that you see on the side here um, shows basically the number of companies uh, that are listed uh, in Canada um, and Australia and uh, in UK. Those are the main markets for financing uh, for uh, body materials and for strategic materials. Canada has a, the highest number of companies. It does not necessarily mean we, and we have had, I should say, we have had for nearly 20 years, attracted the highest percentage of uh, exploration financing. We lost that position in 2020 for, for Australia for the first time. Um, but uh, so I'm not sure Sorry, in 2019, we lost that position. I'm not sure uh, for 2020, I have not seen those numbers, whether we regain that again, uh, we Canada. But um, Canada has lots of, of companies we always had, but they are not been very successful. Um, we have um, dozens of rare earth companies, dozens of lithium companies, uh, dozens of new, I'm talking about new projects, uh, new graphite projects for over 15 years. Um, been trying to develop them and none of them have been successful. Australia has, was successful with Linus and the reason why they were successful is because the, the Japanese have followed a little bit of the model of China. So uh, the funding that go into, into Linus was mainly loans from, from, from Japanese companies that were extremely, extremely patient and they continue to be. Uh, they did not allow the company to fail. The similar company in US, which was called Molycorp. And now they are they have still the mine. There's a new company called MP Materials. 
um, they come, they came back again and they're trying to still uh, process. They only mine the material and they export the material to China where it is essentially uh, processed and then returned back to US and other, and other markets. So the US mines rare earth, but they do not process it. And the company that was there before, Molly Corp, that was developing the same fashion as Linus in, in Australia, they failed because the creditors were not as patient as the as creditors for Linus. So that is a model of development, um, which again, I'm not gonna spend too much time explaining, but most of these companies are uh, basically funded through the stock market. And when you see the funding, most of it is, it's, it's not a lot, first of all, going to exploration, um, leaves a, a very, uh, you know, it's, it's a high competition for very small amounts uh, of, of, of funding. The other issue that these companies have is that they are, um, the, these projects have is that they are extremely complex. They're technically risky. The last presenter sort of touched a little bit on that. Um, the processing of rare earth or even lithium um, and um, for the recovery, even for byproducts um, like for, for cobalt and others, it's, it's not so straightforward. Uh, it's very energy intensive usually, which then makes it complicated. Uh, for developing countries that don't have uh, the necessary power infrastructure to, to support some of these projects. But in this particular slide, the other thing that I want to bring, and again, I think Magnus sort of uh, presented that in a way, this is just a different way of showing it, is that some of these markets are really small. So if you look at, uh, and this is just a schematic, I'm not showing you know, uh, exact numbers here, but here you have the price, gold obviously has a high price, and here's the tonnage. Uh, iron ore supports you know, almost uh, 1 trillion tons of, 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 of um, sorry, uh, steel production a year. Um, and then we have uh, bauxite, which is for aluminum. Sorry? Oh, okay, somebody is, is talking, so I, I'm almost done here. So, um, so we can see that uh, you know the critical materials, lithium, cobalt, rare earth, carbonate, and graphite. This is very small markets. For instance, rare earth carbonate market per year is just over a billion dollars. And if you look at these projects in Australia and in Canada, each one of them, the capex is almost a billion. So you can see it's very difficult for investors to put money uh, in, in these companies when the markets are not very big. Um, investors usually look for four years uh, return payback and uh, an internal rate of return of 20%. And these projects at the prices that they are, uh, the, the, the metals are, um, it's not really possible to do this. So um, finally, this is my last slide. So what needs to be done? Uh, in a nutshell. So government should collaborate to increase discovery of critical materials around the world. The US uh, has something like that, um, you know, so that should be done uh, more uh, coordinate in, in a, they need, the countries need to coordinate in, in a better sort of way. Uh, government should collectively invest in infrastructure. Large resources of critical materials are in remote areas. Uh, the last presenters show, um, the last two presenters, Magnus also indicated that they have uh, you know, identified different projects, but there's far more in Northern Canada to be discovered than in Africa. Uh, most of the projects uh, that are, most of the, the, the currencies that they have been identified are back are from uh, the colonial times. And uh, so there is a lot more that needs to be done. So government should collaborate to invest in mineral projects via low interest loans, equity investment, grants, uh, definitely grants, lower taxes and, and other ways. And, um, and then also support the supply chains by offering aid to, res to resource companies, uh, to processors, metal fabricators. So it's a whole uh, supply chain. Not all the mining companies are the same ones that will produce sorry, they will produce the, the final metal. So, uh, so we have, for instance, Vale, Vale, uh, Rio Tinto, uh, they produce, uh, you know, uh, iron ore, but they're not necessarily the ones that, um, you know, uh, produce steel. So that is a similar situation for, for various uh, metals. And, you know, it's out of scope here to, to go and, 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 and talk about the supply chain. So resource rich countries should avoid resource nationalism, obviously, but that's real, even for Canada. Canada wants to maximize um, their resources because there's a lot of money that goes in uh, in, in, in invest, investing uh, in, in the country. So for instance, there are billions 
plan potentially for roads to the north, north of Quebec, which is one of the, the key provinces for Canada for resources, but also north of Ontario. There are, you know, there's so much nickel and, 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 and chrome in those areas of Ontario. Um, but the infrastructure requirements are ridiculous for the size of the country. Canada only has 36, uh, 38 million people. Uh, you know, although it's relatively a rich country, but it, it's a small country. And to support the rest of the world resources, they will need a support for that. The same thing with Africa, much more, because countries are not as rich. So finally, we need to invest in R&D and skills training centers. Uh, R&D is tremendously important. We still are not able to compete with China in the production of, for instance, rare earth metals um, and in other, in other metals. So um, the key to be able to um, develop these projects is not relying so much in the stock market for the reasons I explained uh, and see more support from governments, um, at least in the, in the initial stages. The stock market will come later. This has to be in the form of aid, which means you put the money, you may or may not get your return, but uh, definitely many of, um, of the, 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 the projects, many of the the, the companies that are developing these projects, they need funding. And what I'm basically suggesting is something a little bit more coordinated, um, you, know, uh, um, you know, and it has to happen now because we've, we're literally, uh, we're running out of time as, as EVs uh, production and, and, and demand uh, increases. So I could, I could uh, discuss a little bit more detail how that could be done um, afterwards, but uh, essentially this is, this is it, thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Luisa, very comprehensive. Um, Dave Mayer asked the interpreters and all the participants that we extend the time until 5.15. I don't think that will be a problem now. Okay, so if everybody would have the patience to, to stay for 15 minutes longer so that we can have a closing discussion afterwards. Thank you. Um, our next um, speaker will be Carlos Peiter from Brazil. And um, he will talk about niobium as a strategic metal um, for Brazil. Carlos, please. So. So thank you very much, IRTC and United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. Uh, I am Carlos Paita from the Center for Mineral Technology, Brazil. And the title of my speech is Niobium as a Strategic Metal for Brazil. Okay, we have a recent report that was supported by the program uh, Sectoral Dialogues, EU, Brazil Sectoral Dialogues, and also with some fundings from our Ministry for Science and Technology and Innovations, where we, we made a very deep study on one critical raw material. The case study was niobium and the partners, the partnerships that we, we had in this study where the my institution, CETEN, the other institution, IBIC, the Engineers School of the University of Sao Paulo, and also European and Research and Academic Institutions, of course, the Joint Research Center, ISPRA, Italy, and INAP, Aachen University. Uh, it was very important that the Brazilian company, the largest niobium producer in the world, CBMM, Companhia Brasileira de Metallurgia e Mineração, made a cooperation agreement with us. And this was, as I will see, was very, very important. This report is available in this site of the sector dialogues now. Okay. This is the map that everybody showed till now, okay? So here that we have, I think we have Brazil has and have many uh, critical raw materials or strategic materials to offer to the world. But in this case, we just uh, were indicated for the, our Niobium huge production. 
Uh, this is more or less is in Portuguese, but uh, of course you can understand that the, what is the contribution of Brazil in let's say the global production of those uh, metals and ores. Niobium is the first, but it's not our main mining or mineral market. Uh, iron ore is the, the most important uh, mining product for Brazil and for trade. But we also have tantalum, most of times associated with niobium, tantalite, columbite, vermiculite, natural graphite, and many other minerals and metals that we, we share in the international trade, in the world trade. So why is niobium important? Niobium is very important nowadays for the steel industry and for applications such as the steel for pipelines. The niobium steels, the high strength, low alloy steels for construction, for transportation, for the automobile industry, for super alloys. And this is a, let's say, a strategic uh, material for the European particle collider, yeah? because without niobium, the, you know, the superconductors maybe would cost much, much more superconductors that uh, promote the, 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 the super uh, magnetism effect. One very new uh, development is are those uh, niobium titanium oxide anodes for batteries. Uh, it's a very important partnership between CBMM and Toshiba company in Japan and many other uh, partners, as much as I know. One thing that is important is that uh, niobium is not a rare metal. Is not a rare, is not, is, is, it is, we have a lot in Brazil, of course, you can see here, né, the high content and the high volume of for the deposits, most of them are in Brazil. But we have here in this study from our Canadian geologists, at least 47 deposits already known and most of them already, let's say, with calculated reserves. So niobium is not rare, but of course God probably would like to make the Brazilians né, the more, the more, the, 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 the main site. Here you see the main niobium products producing companies. CBMM is the leader uh, with many products. Ferro-niobium for the steel industry is the more, most important, but also all the spe specialties like the vacuum grade, ferro-niobium, nickel-niobium oxides, and niobium metal for the superconductor, for instance, and superconductor grade and, and so on. The second uh, is the Neobras that now is, was, is owned by the uh, China Molybdenum Corporation and also producer of uh, ferroniobium and is the second producing, producer of apatite of uh, uh, phosphorus uh, fertilizers uh, input uh, minerals or fertilizers in Brazil. Niobec, the Canadian company in Quebec uh, province, and Taboca, uh, Mineração, which is uh, located in the Amazon, is owned by a Peruvian company, Minsur, and is uh, now producing ferrotantal and ferroniobium too. Well, this is one of the exercises we made in our report, in our study, the study of critical materials production chains, opportunity and threats of the circular economy. That was to, to, to see how 
ferroniobium flows through the world and through the markets that uh, deserve, that need the ni niobium for materials, okay? This is another exercise, is how ferroniobium niobium flows to the Portuguese, sorry, to the transportation uh, industry. Uh, pequeno porte, small vehicles, grande porte, larger vehicles, and how niobium flows after this to reuse, refurbishing, recycling, and discard. Everything you can see in the report. Another interesting part of our report was this exercise to check how circular Niobium is. Uh, there are many uh, available indicators and tools to make it, but we choose the, the MCI from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And in our exercise, using the, the material flow analysis from Europe, because we don't have this, uh, this data from Brazil. We, we reach those two numbers né? from a, a scale from zero to one, where zero is nothing circular and one totally circular. Uh, niobium generic was 0.14 and niobium in steels 0.11. So uh, we conclude that this is still uh, a, a low circular has a low circularity. Another interesting part of our study was the study on innovations. Uh, please, you have to know that the niobium here, the, 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 the search in the database was a very wide search. The name niobium in the abstract, in the title, from papers and from patents. That's it. In this time frame, 13, uh, 12, 13, 12, 19, 12, 13, 12, 18 for patents. And we, so the samples that we found, we found out was about 5,000 papers where niobium is mentioned and 3,000 patents where niobium is mentioned and is mentioned uh, connected to this kind of materials here. So you can see that metallurgy and steels are still the main interest of, of, the, of the industry, of the economy. But we can see also that some different words also appear like anode, cathode, sensor, electrode. So those, uh, energy appliances of niobium are still becoming more uh, raising or are, are increasing. Well, uh, which country has or is, is more active, dynamic in, in, in patents? It's China, okay, after we have US and Korea, Russia, and also the European here probably is the, the I don't know, the patents that are deposited on, in the European community altogether. But this is very important eh, that, uh, that the patents in, in are very important from uh, Chinese owners. Well, this is a very important part of our study. Uh, this is a joke, but I have to tell you. Do you remember the movie, The Man in the Iron Mask? Do you remember that uh, John Malkovich went to the castle where Leonardo DiCaprio was in prison and stopped at the gate and said, open the gate. It was a brilliant 
phrase said by John Malkovich. So what I, I'm going to say, CBNN opened its gate to a group of researchers, Brazilian and European, and opened its data for a complete life cycle assessment from cradle to gates of ferroniobium, as well as the report of social life cycle assessment of niobium. Very important. Not many companies in the world allow this kind of, that's of freedom. So, the last slide. Why is niobium strategic for Brazil? I bring some very good reasons. There must be some others too. But first, very large amount of available minerals resources with high niobium contents, okay? National and international companies operating mines and metallurgical units in Brazil at high level production standards. Promising future due to innovations developed and underdeveloped in many countries, many with Brazilian companies partnership. CBMM invests a lot in innovation, in partnerships. And fourth, important contribution to sustainability, improving energy and materials conservation. Why? Because when you use, for instance, niobium in steel, the, the, the strength of the steel raises, increases, and so you, you can make the same product with less material. This is the, one of the main reasons for the use of uh, high strength, low alloy steels with niobium in the automotive industry. But of course, we, already, we now know that we have to improve niobium circularity. So this is my contribution. I thank you very much for your attention and please don't abandon Brazil. We are in a very bad shape now and I also ask for your praise. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Carlos. This was extremely interesting. Um, a good example, and I would like to follow up on, on the transparency you just mentioned in the end with the social and LCA reports, which will directly lead us to our next talk of uh, Nathan Williams from MindSpider on the potential of blockchain technology to increase transparency. Thank you. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. Can you see my screen? I hope so. I will just yes. Great. I'll put it in read mode so everyone can see it. So let's have a change of pace and talk about the exciting world of blockchain. So uh, this has been a big topic for a couple of years now about the potential for this emerging technology to transform the mineral industry, to improve transparency in the mining sector so people know where materials come from and under what conditions they've been produced. Um, we've been at this since 2017. Uh, and it, it, the, the nugget of it, if you haven't heard of blockchain, is that blockchain is, it, it's not that hard to understand. The basic idea is that it's a database that you can use to make unique digital items. Now, if you have a digital item, you usually think of a sound file or a movie file, something that can be copied a million times. But what if you knew which was the original and which were the copies? Well, then they can store value. Uh, and the most common place you hear of blockchain is with Bitcoins. Uh, there's a unique number of them. You know which are the originals and they are valuable and the copies are not valuable. Well, what we do is instead of storing financial value, we create digital certificates that can't be copied, they can't be changed, the data on them is unchangeable, and they can be linked together, gathering information from every supply chain actor in order to be able to get a better picture of what's going on in the supply chain, of where the materials come from, and the conditions under which they've been produced. Now, 
The, uh, we have worked with a couple of different directions. There's two directions that you can go with supply chain traceability. You can start at a mine site and push data down the supply chain, hopefully going end to end. And uh, this is what we've done with, uh, with a group that started at Minsur's uh, tin mine in Peru, uh, at San Rafael mine, tracking downstream to a couple of uh, uh, two different end users. And we've also gone in the other direction, starting with a downstream company, Volkswagen, down, the downstream brand wanted to discover who is in their supply chain. We went to the tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers to see who is in the supply chain, what data we can recover. It, it gets fairly complex, but, the, but essentially um, there's a lot more you can do than just provenance. You can find out information on carbon emissions. You can find out information on policies. Who's supplying data and who's reluctant to supply data in your supply chain? Or if you're a mineral producer, you can uh, help your customers with documents that, uh, that, that reduce the time at the border. Uh, it's not just about responsibility. And as many people have commented already, it's about criticality. Uh, can we secure an access to, uh, to a supply of materials? Uh, do I know what the what the grades are, or what the or, or that the materials I'm receiving are what I actually paid for? How can I have confidence in the data? So that's what we can use this technology to do. Now, let's talk about the downsides. We've done a couple of big pilot projects, and uh, we we did it using what's called a digital twin model. So we use this blockchain to create digital twins of shipments of material. One ton of metal equals one ton of blockchain certificate. And we would use a QR code to, uh, to link those two together. Now, with a digital uh, twin model, the problem is that you need an end to end consortium to start, and those don't scale very well. All right, so the, it, it's difficult to get started if you need to sign everybody up before you begin traceability. Uh, and if you don't sign everybody up before you begin, you run into the problem of uh, of interrupted chain of custody. So what if someone in the middle of the supply chain says, blockchain is uh, interesting, but I've got COVID right now. I don't want to do blockchain. I'll just sell my metal, thank you very much. Well, what happens is that the digital twin will get to the, uh, get to the person that's too busy for it, and then the metal will continue on and you lose track of that data. So uh, you also have the problem of differing needs in the supply chain. So the upstream participants, they, they want market access. They want data for their investors or to say, hey, we've got a social license to operate. Uh, they might want access to new markets. Uh, they want to differentiate their products that they're proud of from just standard commodities that get the same price. Uh, whereas regulators and downstream companies are more interested in transparency, supply chain security. It, it, it's different sets of needs. And the traders in the middle, uh, they, they have a shifting set of needs that uh, and historically they've wanted to protect their supply chain information, didn't want to be part of this, but now they're taking on more of, uh, more of an active role in supply chains. And so we're seeing, uh, we're seeing a lot of different needs that are conflicting here. And we often approach this from the regulatory transparency and downstream needs without considering how this affects the upstream. So I think that to see uh, scalability in blockchain solutions and better transparency in our supply chains, we're going to need producers to see value from traceability on their own. I'm not sure why that. Uh, uh, second. Sorry, I seem to have had a. Ah, oh, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. Next. Um, so let's. Uh, so. How, how can we do something that, that, that scales? Well, uh, the general approach when you're dealing with two sides of a marketplace is to start with supply. You want more supply because the issue when it, it, with end-to-end -end traceability, we could give a big company like Google or Apple 100% of their minerals from traced responsible sources. But where does everybody else in the world get their minerals from? And so unless we increase the supply of traceable, responsible uh, material, uh, we are just shifting the problem uh, to someone else. Um, and so 
we to do this, you want to start with incentives for responsible suppliers. Suppliers, they want to decommoditize, uh, they want to stand up from the competition. And so this is what we did, is we built a system, uh, we basically rebuilt our whole system in, in this way where we can um, do point-to-point -point traceability. What does this mean? Um, our system now uses a, a QR code that isn't a digital twin. Instead, it's more like a two-sided certificate. It's sort of like an invoice, right? It, it, it links data from a sender to a receiver. Why is this important? Well, if Alice sends a ton of mineral to Bob, Alice would create a one-ton certificate that says I sent a ton to Bob. If Bob is too busy and doesn't want to deal with this, they just send the mineral on to Charlie who processes it. Charlie will receive that QR code that was sent to Bob and can then request access from Alice. So we can skip over Bob and still maintain the chain of custody. That's what we wanted to do. And then we can address the, the data that we collect to each use case at every segment of the supply chain. So we started this in Rwanda with a, a, a partner that we have there, uh, Luna Smelter. What we did is we attached these QR codes that you see at the bottom to every shipment of mineral uh, of tin that's coming out of their Luna Smelter in Kigali. And when anyone scans that QR code, what they get is documents that are uh, legally required to export that data. So it, it makes it easier to access the export data, but also we answered questions that are legally required to import into the EU under the EU conflict mineral laws. So we were able to, with just one segment of the supply chain, add immediate value so that both sides were interested in participating in this, uh, in this progress. Now, the next step is we can add in mines and we can do mine to smelter chain or we can add in uh, processors and go from a uh, trader or an exporter to importer processor and have a chain of custody there. And then each one of those gets linked together so that we can see the path that the mineral takes. It's a, it's a much more expandable uh, approach. So this is just to give you an overview of what we've tried, different ways that you can apply blockchain. Uh, I could talk about this for six hours, but I'm not, uh, not going to. Just want to give you a flavor and uh, more than happy to answer questions uh, on the chat or, uh, or you can follow up with me on LinkedIn or email me at Nathan at MindSpider.com. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Nathan, for, for introducing this. is a very interesting um, business model. So now the next, uh, the last two talks will be more about secondary supply. And um, first we'll have Atirta Biswas from India, who will um, tell us about the formalization of the recycling sector or the recycling sector in general in India. Tita, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alexandra. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Perfect. Um, and thank you for having me. And um, good evening from India. And I gonna I am um, I work for a not for profit policy research think tank, and uh, we primarily work on climate change. But also one of our research focus is also looking at resource security and India's long term climate uh, strategies. So. Uh, jumping to this topic, I, as, as I speak, India is going through a helium crisis right now. Um, India has been importing uh, most of its helium requirements from US, and as US right now is uh, attempting to kind of seize as a, as a put a ban on the exports, India industries are frantically looking for alternate sources. Um, I would also want to emphasize a point is. Um, we had developed a, a critical minerals framework for the government of India, and that was developed in the year 2016. And the framework was the only, the, the first of its kind and only one framework for India, uh, which highlights the challenge that uh, the larger discussion of critical minerals in India is still at a very nascent stage. Uh, we are still, as I think one of our presenter mentioned that, the majority of the revenues from mining in India are still reliant on your bulk minerals like coal, iron, iron ore, aluminium, etc. So the larger question that we also are right now grappling with is as we move to a low carbon economy, how do we transition jobs, how do we transition revenues from the bulk minerals to 
to uh, resources which are like critical minerals or strategic strategic metals which will be used in a low carbon technology so uh, the framework then evaluated 49 minerals across 16 manufacturing sectors and here you will see a snapshot of 2030 again the list of minerals is also very similar and uh, and also that you hear more often about uh, there are two notable mentions over here is we did see phosphate and potash coming up as a critical minerals because a they are uh, they have implication on the national food security and india is also entirely import dependent uh, the other interesting mineral that came out was dolomite um, it's it primarily used in the iron steel industry and as india's iron capacity is anticipated to grow almost by threefold uh, we are looking at a significant consumption levels of dolomite and the other system on the supply implication is we have a de depleting resources we have de degrading uh, grades and which means that we are more reliant on imports on dolomite so what drives india's uh, future criticality and why it is important right now and why india should start thinking about it uh, i think we already discussed the important uh, the, the the approach on low carbon economy and, and sort of a focus on certain new technologies like electric vehicles batteries hydrogen and all but uh, one of the important points is india uh, at the onset of the covid uh, pandemic the government of india rolled out uh, a significant amount of uh, fiscal incentives and support measures uh, for the domestic industries and one of the notable schemes was a perform production linked incentive scheme to support 10 critical sectors and most of them yes they are specialized steel steel manufacturing but most of them are also aimed towards low carbon manufacturing like sort of solar photovoltaics or uh, ev storage batteries uh, but one important point I want to mention over here is uh, if you look at an electrolyzer stack, right, the cost of stack, materials represent 45% of the total bottom up manufacturing cost. So just by providing a production link incentive scheme will not incentivize manufacturing. A 45% share is a massive uh, so a contribution. Any movement in global prices will have a direct implication on literalizer manufacturing costs in India, uh, which also then kind of highlights that why need, India needs to secure resources. And today's presentation, I will focus on uh, one one aspect of it, which is the recycling or more uh, uh, particularly is the e-waste recycling in India. So here, uh, this slide talks about the typical minerals or metals that can be recovered. Uh, again, I think we all are aware of those metals and, and some of them are base metals. We do have some technology metals and some of uh, them are precious metals, right? And if we map it, India's uh, 2019 uh, supply situation, we see that for most of them, except the base metals and precious, precious metals, India are entirely import dependent. Either India is importing it or not necessarily consuming it because there's no a domestic industry that uh, where the mineral is being currently consumed. Uh, just to give an overview of how India's way, U.S. Uh, supply chain situation is right now. In 2019, India generated around 1.2 million tons of e-waste. That puts India as a third largest e-waste generator and also as a 12% share of global e-waste generation. Uh, if you look at the typical characteristics, uh, Com computer, telecommunication, tel telecom equipments, and uh, small IT uh, represents bulk of the US, and that's mostly, and that's majorly the generated by uh, the service sector industries. Whereas large appliances or medical equipment represents a 15% share, and finally the small households uh, represents a 3%. Uh, but what star what stark difference is out of this 1.2 million tons, only 2.5% is actually recycled. And uh, out of this 2.5%, you have a very high share of informal sector, uh, which represents around 95% of the US, uh, e-waste flowing there. And the remaining 5% is handled or sort of processed by the formal sector uh, recyclers. So how, so this unorganized supply chain, right? How does it impact India? And where do we see the potential of uh, e-waste recycling addressing India's uh, uh, long-term uh, mineral security. 
over here, the table uh, represents India's current imports of certain minerals, which we also find in the EWS value chain. And, uh, and it compares with the embedded flows in the current EWS that's been generated. Uh, the ratios that we have taken for this is primarily, um, we have only chosen the small IT and, 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 and the computer sector. We have ignored battery recycling and the large uh, appliances for now. Uh, one thing that's, that we find out that in 2019, India imported around $324 million worth of CMR metals, right? Uh, critical mineral uh, resources of metals. And, and it's a small fraction because India's total mineral import bill was $59 billion. Uh, but what is also stark is out of this 325 million, 45% 45 per, 45 of the value can be actually recovered from recycle, recycling of the existing flows. Uh, except tungsten, which you, uh, and I think to, to some extent is lithium. But again, as you as we start battery manufacturing, uh, the lithium recovery will go up. But the other important point which I want to kind of bring your attention to is uh, we are recycling over here. Uh, I mean, eighty percent of one point two million uh, tons of EVS flows, right? That's a lot of supply. But even with that with that huge amount, uh, the the quantity that we can recover of our, will be a fraction of India's future demand, uh, which significantly, which highlights the, the, the importance of the scale that EVS recycling needs to happen to even cater to us a, a modest share of mineral demand in the future. And particularly with the low carbon technologies where the mineral demand is multiple folds compared to a conventional uh, technologies. So I'll present two case studies where India is currently relying on recycled critical minerals uh, and other parts of the world. I'll take two examples. One is palladium, the other one is selenium. Uh, in 2019, India import, imported one ton of selenium and all of it was from UK. And if you trace back UK flows, yeah, you will uh, you will uh, you will see that UK imports most of its palladium from Belgium, right? And if I just look at Belgium, uh, Belgium imported seven tons of palladium from Germany, but exported 114 tons of palladium. Uh, and if you so dig deeper, you'll, understand, you'll know that there's a, a Yumiko plant, which palladium is one of the recycled uh, product. Now let's move to selenium. Uh, we all know selenium is, uh, is uh, recycled from anode mud, which is a sort of a byproduct of a copper refining. Uh, and India is, uh, Korea is one of a sort of a, 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 a sort of a primary supplier of selenium for India. In 2019, India imported roughly 136 tons of uh, selenium from uh, Korea. Uh, and if you look at Korea's uh, uh, Korea, uh, Korea, you will see Korea imported 17 tons, but exported 581 tons of selenium. Now, uh, what we are, are know that Korean smelters, Korea doesn't have copper ores, right? Their smelters are 100% reliant on imported ores. And Korea right now is the fifth largest exporter of selenium. Now, compared to India, uh, India also has a fair bit of imported copper ores. Uh, but there are two Indian plants which ranks fifth and sixth amongst largest copper refineries. Yet we are we did try out extracting selenium in 2015, but after that there has been uh, no attempt to recover selenium from a uh, uh, refining of copper ores. So what needs to be done? I'll uh, I'll try. To, I've I tried to kind of bucket them into three broad sections. The first one is the strengthening of national policies. Uh, if you look at the India's recycling policy, it, it, it sort of targets, a, it has a collection based target. It doesn't have a recycling target. What it means that while you are incentivizing collection, but you're not recovering all possible minerals out of it. So if you look at the current value chain, uh, and we have spoken to a lot of recyclers and, and, the, and evidence suggests that we have a a, f a good number of mechanical separation capacities, but a, ve a, a few chemical separation capacities. And even the chemical separators who are currently there are just working at a very low uh, a load factor or, 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 uh, yeah, or, of their sort of uh, uh, processes. Uh, and if you look at 2019, between 2015 and 2019, you will see the India's electronic waste import increased by more than 390 percentage, whereas the refining capacity is just remained constant. The second part we are also uh, we recommend is uh, increasing the scope of EPR or extend or also known as the extended producer's responsibility. Some of the one of the common practice is uh, mandating the the the, the OEMs so or the producers uh, to take back the equipment, right? And 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 with a uh, with a replacement for uh, of a new equipment for certain incentives. Uh, one what will this 
uh, sort of uh, measure do is it will stop in uh, waste flowing into the informal sector. And, and as, uh, as I've demonstrated previously is once the waste goes in the informal sector, there's absolute no way to track who is recycling, what are the minerals been, uh, been recovered. We also have seen that India is ex exporting a lot of shredded PCB uh, and, and, uh, and when we sort of spoke to the recyclers and we found out that India recycles a lot of visible gold. Uh, silver and copper from the PCB, and they are just a. And if you look at the recycling rates, it's just a fraction of what you can recover. It's one one eight grams of silver per ton of uh, PCB, zero point zero two tons. Uh, sorry, one eight tons of, one eight grams of gold, zero point zero two kgs of silver, and zero point one eight tons of copper. And and the remaining uh, PCBs are also known as uh, also what you also commonly call as somets are crushed and then exported outside. Uh, the second recommendation that we want to we provide is strengthen the national inventory. Uh, tracking the minerals are important to understand what minerals we can recover, what our recycling rates are, how much we are utilizing the existing capacity. Our, uh, we analyze the current uh, uh, recycling capacity, and and we and one of the stark things that we found out is the current recycling capacity is actually more than e-waste generation, but because of the inconsistent flows and uh, the uh, sort of underdefined supply chains, the, there's not enough uh, material that's going into the recycling capacities. Uh, what we also looked at is uh, the act, right? The act mandates uh, records, uh, I mean, the dismantlers and the recyclers to keep records. Uh, but however, there's the reporting process back to the central agencies, uh, which are the state and the central pollution control board in India. Uh, they are infrequent and they have no standardized reporting structures. Uh, very few states actually record, but the records are mostly limited to the, the tons of e-waste that's where, that they're processed, but not on the tons uh, on the various uh, products that they are able to extract. Um, the final is uh, final point is uh, in the digital age, right? We and 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 sort of the and, and the age of innovative solutions. I think we can easily triangulate information. Uh, recently, uh, uh, with the new EPR norms in 2018. Uh, there has been an increasing increase in the uh, in number of uh, uh, what we call as producer responsive organization or, or known as pros uh, uh, the the oems or the us producers they generally outsource their uh, the management of the end of life waste to these organizations and they are basically the links between your collection centers and the recyclers or dismantlers uh, we have a 51 pros today as of date and i think they are rightly placed to talk about how the EVS is flowing in the economy. And our triangulation of information using uh, the, recyc the recyclers, collection centers, and PROs can build a, a, a sort of a robust uh, inventory to track mineral flows. And finally, uh, the last but not the least is uh, how do we develop robust supply chains? We have a huge informal sector, uh, but the approach should be to leverage the complementary sense and opportunities the formal sector has access to advanced recycling technologies, whereas the informal sector have deep supply chains, right? And when we talk about formalization, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have we are looking at a loss of jobs or revenues. If you're able to reskill the informal sector, uh, so, uh, the imp informal sector uh, employees, by giving them incentives to work in a better environment conditions, uh, lesser health risk and job security, we are looking at an uh, increase in income generation, more safe recycling practices, and also higher levels of uh, employment. And the last point is uh, that uh, the robust supply chain should start from our, from our homes. Uh, in India, I think we need to, or there is a need for a more, uh, I would say, consumer awareness on, on segregating a waste. And, uh, and that can lead to a, 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 a sort of a more, uh, a, a more easier uh, uh, flows of waste. And, and that can be further linked up with the existing supply chain. And, and this, the important step over here is to enable access to uh, the collection centers. In India right now, um, uh, what we have noticed that, yes, if I can segregate my waste, for example, if I have a battery waste somewhere, I don't know where to, do, where to kind of sell them to. I, uh, in, right now, I think there's a there's an important role for the local municipal uh, government and institutions like PROs so that they can kind of develop a, a wider and, and a, a sort of network of recycling centers where which can be easily accessed. And I think in Europe, they are uh, 
uh, very uh, good examples of how let's say you can find a uh, collection center in a local grocery store or or there's a there's a look then you can arrange a local pickup from your home but i think that 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 sort of approaches needs to be uh, the best practices needs to be looked at and, and sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, and develop in india so uh, i think with this i i have come to my end of a presentation and i'm happy to take more questions thank you Thanks a little bit, a lot, uh, Tirta. I think that was very, um, very insightful and, and, and a very good outlook and policy recommendations. Thanks a lot. Um, also a lot of this novel uh, to me. Uh, just to let you, everyone know, so we will certainly not be able to, um, to, to, to cover all questions later. So I, I uh, ask once again, put your questions in the chat or your comments or uh, on the whiteboard. And uh, the, my colleague Divertia, who will now have the final presentation, will show you a link where you actually can sign up for, 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 for an email. And then we will send you the summary of actually all the inputs um, afterwards. I'll elaborate on this afterwards. But now let's come to the final talk. It will be by Divertia Strivers from WeLoop. And she will talk about circularity strategies to secure supply results from uh, international collaboration. Uh, Divertia, please. Yeah, hello everyone. Thank you for uh, sticking with us if we uh, have uh, a little bit of a delay. So indeed, um, I will present some results from my international collaboration in the context of the IRTC business project about indeed uh, circularity strategies to secure supply. So first I will quickly introduce IRTC. IRTC stands for the International Roundtable on Materials Criticality. And it's a project funded by EIT Raw Materials, which is a body of the European Union under the Horizon 2020 program. And within this project, we organize workshops and uh, at international conferences and uh, also online. And we publish the results of these workshops in joint publications and also workshop reports. In the project, we try to advance research uh, in the field of criticality assessment and also international exchange and to increase awareness, especially now focusing on companies about materials criticality. So we succeeded within the IRTC network to create an international network, including experts from research and industry. And this year we will aim to develop an online tool that will help companies to make uh, to better make decisions regarding critical raw materials. So here you see a link. And um, please go there to know more about IRTC and also to sign up for the newsletter to stay in touch. So in this presentation, I will show you, I will discuss how circularity could contribute to mitigating criticality. And we will look at this from different angles. And this work was done in the context of a publication, a joint publication with partners from the IRTC project which we submit in uh, resources, conservation and recycling. In this paper, we look at five different case studies and each case study has a different critical raw material focus. So one case study is about rhenium used in turbine blades. And we look in each case study from the perspective of an industrial actor. So here, this is the jet engine manufacturer. Next case study is the use of platinum group metals used as in chemical processing catalyst and here from the perspective of the chemical plant. Then we have case study on the use of rare earth elements in hard disk drives produced by Hitachi Group. Also the use of various critical raw materials in consumer electronics uh, produced by Apple. And finally helium used in MRI machines in hospitals. So we first looked in each case study, what kind of circularity strategy is relevant? When we talk about circularity as an um, option to mitigate criticality, we mostly think of end-of-life recycling. And indeed, we saw this back in several case studies. But not only this, we saw, for example, examples of new scrap recycling in the rhenium case study when the rhenium prices increased tenfold, the jet engine manufacturers increased their internal efficiency of rhenium use by a new scrap recycling. And also this, uh, these manufacturers increased their repairing efforts. 
So with this uh, prolonging the use, the lifetime of the, of the blades. Similar to repairing is the regeneration of, of the catalyst that used um, the platinum group metals by regenerating them and topping them up, them up with some additional new platinum group metals. Also their lifetimes can be extended. And we had also an example of reuse in the Apple case where consumers at the end of life of the products can hand in their, their products at Apple stores. And if it's still in a good condition, they can be sold to other users. So we see we should, we should consider all types of circularity strategies and not only focus on recycling. So we also looked at the motivation of companies to implement circularity strategies. And here we saw that often a multitude of motivations are relevant also in parallel. For example, again, the Rhenium case, the Rhenium market is very small. So if there's a disruption in this market, the jet engine manufacturer would be probably affected by this. So increased recycling decreases their vulnerability to any disruptions in this market. But also due to the strong price increases of rhenium, they could also save costs. And we saw with the case of Hitachi, Hitachi Group, that first recycling was motivated by regulation. So the Japanese government provided incentives to increase recycling. And that led the company to invest in new recycling technologies and um, infrastructure. And when all these investments were made, this, they noticed that actually recycling was also cost beneficial. So we see that circularity, which is often mentioned as a solution for the environment, should also be a solution for a company in order to, to take place. Then how can we make circularity work? Here again, you see an example of the rhenium case study. And we showed the processes in the value chain that under control, that, that are under control of the jet engine manufacturer are now highlighted in green. And you can clearly see now that all the circular loops within this, um, within this value chain are actually within this manufacturer. So the manufacturer has direct control of the loops. And this is an example of how vertical integration is really beneficial condition to make circularity work because the company remain a tight control over the material flux. Other, um, so the manufacturer does not control the user, but here they keep strong relationships with the user. And in this case, by providing the engines as a service to the airplanes. So the, the engine manufacturer retains ownership on the, on the engines. And this really enables to, to guarantee that the engine at the end of life comes back to the manufacturer. So indeed retained ownership is also one of, a fact, one of the factors that enables circularity. We also noticed that business to business relationships are, could be easier to make circularity work than business to consumer relationships. If a product is sold to consumers, they can become widely dispersed over a large number of consumers, but also geographically. And we know that collection rates, low collection rates are a big bottleneck in circularity strategies. But maybe especially uh, with the exception of India, as we saw earlier. <laughs> so um, this, this problem of business to consumer relationships could be overcome by mimicking business to business relationships. For example, by letting the consumer also profit from a circularity strategy. And Apple does this, for example, by giving the consumers gift cards if they hand in their phones. Otherwise, is to, uh, other solutions is indeed this retained ownership. And there are several business models, circular business models that focus on this, like leasing and product service systems. Then finally, we also discussed, does circularity actually mitigate criticality? 
And if the company that is concerned about accessibility to critical raw materials, uh, if, if they implement a circularity strategy, this supply risk is only mitigated if the raw materials come back to the same company. So which is here shown in the example of Hitachi Group, where a closed material loop is created to Hitachi. So here, this is an example of closed loop recycling. But normally when we talk about closed loop recycling in other contexts, we don't really talk necessarily about the specific manufacturer. So for example, here, the rare earth elements are recycled from hard disk drives. And in general, when the element is recycled back into other hard disk drives, it could be considered closed loop recycling. And regardless which manufacturer makes those drives. So, but if these recycled rare earth elements are used by other manufacturers, Hitachi Group does not benefit from a decreased supply disruption. So if we, if we talk about circularity in the context of criticality, it's important to take the perspective of a focal actor. And this focal actor is the industrial actor that is concerned about supply risks. So I try to be quick. <laughs> I will provide you the summary. I discussed, we would discuss that different types of critical circularity strategies could be effective to decrease supply risks related to critical raw materials. Circularity strategies can be implemented based on different motives, but they should provide a solution to the company. And we saw three conditions that that provides a good framework to implement a circularity strategy. This is vertical integration of the value chain, retainment of ownership, and the creation of business-to-business -business relationships. And finally, we should make closed, loop, uh, closed loops in the circular economy, but uh, from the perspective of the manufacturer or the other focal actor that is concerned about criticality in order to mitigate criticality via circularity. So again, here the link where you can sign up for the newsletter to stay in touch um, for about this kind of work. And we will also make a report of the workshop today, and this will be uh, diffused via the newsletter. So thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Divertian. So we have now seen that the sustainable supply, of course, um, should not only relate to primary sourcing, but also to secondary. And that this not only concerns recycling, but the different levels of, of um, circularity strategies. And that those are often that it could be of importance that, that there's certain controls by company actors as well, not only by national actors. Um, as I said, I think, I think we had a little longer than expected, but on the other hand, I think that was uh, every um, talk today was extremely rich, and, and I hope you agree with that. Um, as uh, just to tell you that now you can this Miro board, this virtual whiteboard will still be open for um, 10 days and you can still comment there if you're interested. And as I said, if you're interested, we can send you the final report. So um, there's a lot of questions were came in for the panelists. It came on the board, they came in the chat. So I, I have to pick one <laughs> now and maybe the panelists want to reply on it a bit. There was one question and I think it was touched by maybe several um, other comments as well that said it was referring first to the a picture that was shown by Magnus in the beginning that the countries which are rich in critical raw materials are not necessarily are, uh, the same that are um, rich, for example, in petroleum. So what does that mean for the global politics? What does that mean for, for power um, relations and for the balances? And what does that mean for, for us when we hear at, at UN for, the, for global collaboration? And um, if any of the panelists would like, of the speakers would like to reply on that, um, please. Um, okay, here's Lisa, Lisa Moreno. Hi, um, I can make a comment. Yes, please. Uh, 
Um, so in terms of um, of the balance of power, um, I mean, I, I think um, for sure, I mean, the countries that now control um, oil and have a lot of money, uh, you know, because of that, uh, those economies are, are rich because of that, uh, like uh, the Saudis in particular, um, that, that area uh, probably will see a significant shift unless they adopt um, a different model where they would uh, potentially use uh, the funding from, from the oil uh, to diversify. Um, I think Norway would be perhaps another country uh, where you know, they have uh, you know, a very large fund uh, <laughs> that makes the country very rich and they have been able to um, a sovereign fund that is and, and, and that was, was uh, funded in part because of uh, the revenues from, from oil and so forth. So uh, some of those countries will, will in the long, long term, because obviously oil is not going to disappear overnight and we still need uh, oil for many applications, but in the long, long uh, term, um, they will, uh, those countries would have to diversify. And, and, and if the shift is from oil to some of these minor metals and more strategic metals, maybe that's probably what they should be doing is to start funding some of these projects in, in the various countries, perhaps starting with uh, Canada, Australia, some of the more, um, the countries that they probably have uh, better relations with. Um, but um, but they, you know, that's, that is a way of them sort of uh, uh, maintaining uh, their, um, I guess, uh, economies uh, or, 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 or I would say uh, perhaps dollars coming into the economy if from, from resources. If, if that is if that is something they want to continue to do. Um, I know that countries even like Nigeria uh, have started to, and Angola have started to look into their minerals and less into their the oil, um, you know, and, and that's probably uh, a safe bet for, for many of these other countries. Thanks, Luisa. Um, I see uh, Magnus has raised his hand. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I have yes. so. Uh, I, I think this is very important. It gives an opportunity to many countries which are not oil rich or, you know, hydrocarbon rich, but metal rich. And uh, in the African case, I think the African mining vision uh, is a way to, and the African Mineral Development Center now relocated to Guinea is a way to operationalize the possibilities. But it will take time and, and governments, uh, I was a couple of years ago a, an advisor to the Malawi government and I tried to, for one of those major mining uh, conferences, the mining in Daba and Cape Town, I tried to present for the minister a speech where he spoke about critical raw materials, but that is not the way they want, he wanted to do it. He had the traditional, you know, the big, copper, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there is a, a, has to be a shift in, 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 in views of the importance and the potential of these new critical materials. Another aspect which I think is important is also the Chinese. I mean, what are the opportunities in particular for African countries to use the competitive situation which has now come into play with not only the traditional investors from Europe and the US and the traditional uh, colonial powers, but also the Chinese investors. How can these two uh, competing interests be uh, used at the, uh, for the advantage, to the advantage of mineral rich countries in Africa, for example? So in, in short, this, this change is going to be very important. And it's going to be important that uh, emerging economies catch that possibility. Thank you. And um, as a um, as a last input, I see Christoph, you uh, you were also raising your hand. I am allowing you to talk, <laughs> which I have to do. So now it should be possible for you to talk. You have to unmute yourself. Christoph? Promoting you to panelist? No, it, I don't think it works. 
Uh, anyone else who wants to make a final comment? Sorry, I just I just wanted to make another comment uh, yeah. quickly, just to follow up on what Magna is saying yes. and, and the opportunity for African countries. Uh, I, I didn't really uh, brought it up, but uh, you know, another com it's definitely absolutely true. It's, it's it's a fantastic opportunity for for developing nations, uh, definitely not just in Africa, but Africa in particular is so unexplored. Um, but the the other component of all of this, obviously, um, is 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 how to um, to seize the opportunity, uh, how the African countries could potentially use the funding. Because another component is it's, it's of, unfortunately is corruption, um, you know, and and that has to be um, accounted accounted for, um, you know, if if development is to to come to, to to the continent. But there are so many difficulties, you know. Uh, not just the exploration part of it and finding the resources, but also all the training, uh, improving improving of laboratories and and, and uh, universities. I was in Uganda and I did a, a project for, for for the government, which cut all these components to look at education um, and um, you know facilities and in and, 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 and infrastructure to be able to bring value addition. The focus was value addition. Yes, we have the minerals and how are we gonna bring that supply chain? And there are so many, so many issues. And I think definitely the rest of the world can support Africa on that. Um, but that is also a, a tremendous um, you know, uh, component of the African nations and the countries mm -hmm. itself to manage those resources. Like, you know, I gave the example of Norway, how they, they sort of used the funding from, from their resources to, to benefit the, the country. Yeah, that's a very good point. And I'm, this is also one of the reasons I'm really happy we can discuss this here in this UNEC context. Um, I, I want to thank again the, the Dave, Fari and, and, and all the the, the, the secretariat for giving us this opportunity and I hope that we can continue this dialogue. Um, as I said, please please um, feel free to, to still comment on the board, which will be open. And um, I would like to continue this discussion maybe next year. I hope a lot that it will be in person then <laughs> and because it makes things so much easier and um, so much more interactive. And uh, yes, as somebody said before, let's pray that um, we'll all get through this. And for each of you, whoever you are, um, all the best. And I hope to see you another yeah, time. Um, Alyssa, please, um, we'll have a few conclusions and yes. recommendations and uh, Dave will be taking yep, it yeah, just, yes. yeah, Let me say thank you very much, Alessandra, for, uh, for, for uh, uh, moderating the session. It was really well and very interesting. Uh, and again, thank all the speakers. Did you have, did you have a final thought you wanted to say there? No, sure. thanks. Okay, very good. So thank you very much. So we are going to uh, read through a few conclusions and recommendations that we're suggesting that would be, be adopted as a result of the conversations today. So I'll, I'll read those out in the interest of interpretation. Um, number 37, the expert group noted the G7 Economic Resiliency Initiative on critical raw materials by the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and agreed to include the framework for sustainable management of CRMs in UNRMS, as well as details in support of the resources as a service model. Number 42, the expert group noted the progress in the development of UNRMS as a global framework for integrated and sustainable resource management. UNRMS will provide both a universal information framework to provide stakeholders the information they need and guidance on management of resources that will benefit society in alignment with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I, sh I should mention that these next three here, the number, that one and the net following two, are a result of some conversations that were had at this morning's sessions for those of you who weren't there. Number 43, following the request of the Committee on Sustainable Energy, the expert group requested the UNRMS subgroup to accelerate development of UNRMS as a system in line with the proposals outlined in document draft UNRMS provision for structure and guidelines. The expert group further requested the UNRMS subgroup to agree with the Bureau a detailed plan for development and adoption of UNRMS including a timeline with specific and measurable deliverables. The expert group requested the UNRMS subgroup to develop communication briefs to explain the system to all stakeholders. The expert group also requested the UNRMS subgroup in cooperation with the Bureau to inform the Committee on Sustainable Energy at its uh, 30th session on progress uh, made. 
Uh, that is all, Dave. Okay, very okay. good. Okay. Um, so with that, uh, I would guess to thank, uh, thank everyone um, for attending. Uh, the next session will be tomorrow morning um, for session seven on a global action plan on sustainable resource management. The session will start at uh, 10 a.m. Geneva time. It will be using a different platform than we're using now. They're using the Interprefy platform, which you should all have a link for that. And uh, um, if you don't have that, uh, send a note to uh, um, the resources email um, that, that Charlie gave out earlier in, the, in, the, um, in, in the, the chat room today. So thank you all. And I look forward to speaking with you all tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you.